It's been a while since we, as a congregation, in unison, confessed our historical faith. In Latin, it is known as symbolum apostolarum or symbolum apos apostolis apos. The leesum. Uh, not that I read Latin all the time, you know. <laughs> Known to us as the Apostles' Creed. Church, universal church, have been repeating Apostles' Creed in various forms since 5th century. Think about that. Since 5th century. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. That's the statement of faith. Early church, early Christians... For early Christians, those, those words were, were very uplifting. Uh, it was a confessional statement. It was not just some words, gibberish, religious words. But for them, it was life and death, right? In the early church... Making such confession had some consequences, right? In some countries, even today, making such faith statement would lead you to prison or prosecution or even death. And yet, in spite and despite of all those threats that hung overhead, they still chose to confess. Ah, what we just did is a powerful statement. Yeah, powerful statement. And so today we stand on those shoulders of the faithful ones who understood and witnessed God's redeeming grace. That is what appealed to them. That is what moved them. That is what really enabled them to turn the lives around and recommitted their lives to God who was in their hearts much bigger than, than themselves, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were unashamed to confess it. And so, and so, generations through millennia have recited this historical document. Give me goosebumps. Just thinking about it, you know. Yeah. For them... This confession was a way, not just turning themselves around, but it was also a way to turn the world around. Right? Because transformation 
What happens deep within our being is not supposed to be an island by itself. This powerful work of God has to be perpetuated. You know, long time ago, Luzon, World Council of Churches Evangelism Conference was in Sri Lanka. And the Christian leader in Sri Lanka was trying to define evangelism is one beggar asking the other beggar, let's go find food. Do you get that? It's, it's, it's asking, Jonah, come, let's go and find God. Somebody also said that mission evangelism is, is something like having a, a something contagious because if you have it you give it it's kind of bad for coronavirus you know but but in some ways don't take that too far but but if god has done something for you it is better, worthy, to give it away, right? How about the Samaritan woman, you know, when, when she had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus said, you know, if you come to this well, you will come back again, but if you drink the water, I give it to you. Uh, from within you will flow the springs of living water. You don't have to come back here. And then she was just profoundly amazed. Who are you? And... And then, um, then, then, then her life was changed, right? And then, uh, and then Jesus talked about, you know, about her five husbands, right? But it didn't matter, right? And then, and then, and then, she was so moved, you know, w w w with a conversation that he had with she had with Jesus. What did she do? She went out to her village and shared what God has done for her. Right? That is how faith is defined. It has to be something contagious. Generously contagious. Ah, interesting, interesting there. So, so um, there, is a, there is a passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. God calls Isaiah for ministry. And uh, Isaiah saw this wonderful vision of God. And then this, this, this vision of God was calling him. He saw these beautiful things, but it was something really uh, too far from him. And so he says, The world I live in is unclean. Isaiah says, it's filthy. And I have filthy mouth. I am no good either. How can I take this gospel to the world? I am not worthy. I am not good enough to represent God. I am not worthy to be a vessel of God to carry this good news to the world. Right? 
That's what Isaiah says. And then what happens? An angel of the Lord comes with a live charcoal and touches his lips, right? That's Isaiah 6, right? I'm not making up, right? And then that is to say God purged Isaiah to be a holy vessel unto God to bring the good news of the gospel. Hmm? So, so, so there's this, this life-saving, life-transforming gospel in the world. One day, this educated Pharisee leader came to see Jesus. He was a private audience with Jesus. It seems like, it seems like, the world where Nicodemus came from, he was working for the government. He was a loyal employee of the government. But he was trying to do good. He was trying to bring hope and salvation to people. And when Pilate came, came into power, he was usurping authority with greed. And hope became hopeless. Things weren't really turning around the way he had imagined. In the midst of this struggle to fathom, to understand what's going on, he hears about this Jesus. This Jesus who heals, who, who, who tells parables and, and transforms human lives. He instills in people a deep sense of hope in the midst of all the other unpleasant things that was happening. And so Nicodemus decided, I need to go and see this guy. I need to go and see Jesus. Because my world is falling apart. I need to go and have a private conversation with Jesus and see what he tells me. Well, we don't have the whole conversation or how long they sat there and talked to each other. But basically Jesus said, we must be born again. There's got to be change in our lives to bring hope into the people. To bring hope in the world. Does that make sense now? Jesus is saying, you're laboring too hard to find God. You are trying all kinds of things to bring hope where there is no hope. But God can bring hope. For you and for the people you serve. This hope, God's hope, is the answer for you. But you need to have God within you to understand this profound explanation that Jesus is trying to convey to him. See, this is, this is like Jesus said, this is not something earthly can immediately understand. You know? And so... 
Jesus is saying, you need to hear it from heart and allow the Spirit of God to awaken you to understand spiritual matter. Does it make sense now? Yeah. Yeah. The world needs God. The world, our world, needs faith. And people of faith need to live, practice our faith. Right? If we don't practice, nobody will know. You know? Uh, faith is not just about being here on Sunday morning. Right? I think, so, so the question is, when you became Christian, was it something that you had hoped for? Did you get something? Did you experience something that you had imagined from outside looking in? Or you came in and you were disappointed? Is this question making sense? You know? And, and therefore, and therefore um, God is saying to Nicodemus, transformation, you need to change your life around. Um, Apostle Paul in Romans 12 explains it better. He says, transformed your mind, right? In a, Romans 12. The Greek word transformed is metamorpho. For those of you who taught science in elementary school, Metamorphosis is what Apostle Paul was talking about. When an ugly caterpillar turns into a butterfly, that is the kind of transformation Apostle Paul was talking about. That is the gospel that Jesus was talking about to Nicodemus. That is the gospel Isaiah was trying to embrace in the Old Testament. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. That is what who we are. Mm -hmm. We are all called to be wonderful butterflies. You know, carrying the gospel, living the gospel, wherever we go, wherever we are. Be. Being. A servant of God. So, that's the message I have for us today. I hope, I hope you will take this and wrestle with it. What is this born again for myself? How do I build my spirituality based on this conversation Nicodemus had with Jesus? Amen? Thank you.